a lot of you have probably heard about this statistic. Bang. Just 100 companies responsible for 71% of global emissions, studies say. Now, this is a very, very, very important study. However, it is typically cited and referenced in a way that number one doesn't reflect the actual findings of the study, and number two misunderstands the fundamental cause of you know climate change that this study is trying to portray. So let's firstly start with how a lot of people are interpreting this. So a lot of people read this and they read it as 100 private actors, big private conglomerates are releasing a bunch of global emissions and then if they stopped we would probably be chill with climate change and there is a number of issues with that specific claim number one first and foremost is that a lot of these companies or these firms are publicly owned companies as can be listed you can go through these at your own discretion and you will find that a lot of them are actually like publicly run uh, firms or coalitions or companies. Um, now, there's a number of reasons why this misunderstanding is important. Number one, um, it basically delegitimizes an argument of, oh, it's all private actors. If we didn't have private actors, we wouldn't have climate change. And number two, you will get absolutely dumpstered if you cite this in a debate and the opposition replies with, wait, there are public firms there as well, and you don't know that. So that's why it's important to have a good understanding of this. So fundamentally, what this article portrays is it doesn't say that the issue behind climate change is private actors. What it fundamentally says about the situation is that, number one, uh, it is large conglomerates with economies of scale and monopoly oligopoly power that output enough emissions to put the planet at risk. That's number one. Point number two is that this is less of an issue of public and private ownership or managing of firms as much as it is an overall issue with the tragedy of the commons and the existence of resources which are economically viable but that have negative external effects on the world as a whole. The reason why this is significant is because these things weren't different solutions. So. For instance, an individual who says that, oh, if we just had everything be publicly run, we wouldn't have like climate change, that would be an incorrect assertion to make because it is exhibited here that it's entirely possible for public firms to operate in a way that is destructive to the environment and leaves a bunch of emissions. The main takeaways from this study should be twofold. Number one, we need to understand the exponential ability for firms and companies who have reached an economy of scale to be able to release emissions into the atmosphere. That's point number one. Point number two, the issues we face in relation to climate change doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the ownership structures of the firm and have more to do with the types of resources that are available and the effects that the consumptions of those resources has on society as a whole. So the reason why I'm making this video is to ensure that number one, you don't get caught out by being somebody that says, oh, you 100 private companies responsible for 71% of emissions. If we destroy these companies or if we didn't have private companies, this wouldn't be an issue. And then having that be cited to you and having you look really bad in debate. Number two, to ensure people actually properly understand what should be the main takeaways from this debate. Being that number one, yeah, the big, big firm conglomerates, exponentially more emissions. And number two, it has to do with resources despite the ownership structure of the firm that's actually consuming said resources. And that should be the way that this study is interpreted because it is a really important study to prove those specific points. And once again, it goes hand in hand and it in no way conflicts with, with what, at least from my understanding, seems to be the better way by which to handle issues in relation to climate change right now, which are lard, uh, lard, lard. <laughs> which are large, broad, multilateral trade agreements intended to set a floor or a roof across a wide range of countries to prevent uh, disparate degrees of competitiveness 
and essentially encourage all companies to operate on a similar degree of competitiveness and therefore not engage and use and consume resources that have negative external effects. So basically getting big geopolitical and trade superpowers on board with making a trade coalition that says, hey, if you want to trade with us, you need to abide by this climate change regulation, maybe even labor rights regulations, LGBT protections, women rights regulations, and otherwise we're not going to trade with you. And other countries are going to be sort of like softly coercing to join that because otherwise they're going to be locked out of a massive financial market that is those, you know, like large uh, geopolitical powers and trade powers markets. Um, and so they will have to try their best to meet those standards as much as possible. And these standards or the findings of this report do not in any way conflict with those solutions, but they do conflict with a lot of the more intuitive, a lot of the more Twitter solutions you will see in regards to um, emissions and, you know, how much they contribute based on the size of the, uh, the given like firm that is releasing them. Read studies properly. Don't just read headlines. Ensure you understand the thing. Dissect it. Analyze the cause, what it's really saying and what the key takeaways are from it. Otherwise, you're going to look silly when you do a debate and you don't interpret it correctly. So make sure that you cite the 100 companies responsible for 71% of global emissions correctly and don't look like a fool. With that, I'm going to leave you.